Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Nicole Jackson. I will be sharing effective studying tips with you today. Um, and so I guess we can just get started. I would like to note that this is a part of the Sticks 101 Survive and Thrive series, and we'll get started. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna start with the agenda for today. Um, so more than likely, I'm gonna introduce myself. We're gonna discuss mind reset, as well as learning styles, studying strategies, studying online, and then we will conclude with the session. Right, I'm just try to see how to hide this. Yes, I can't hide them. All right. So as I stated before, my name is Nicole Jackson. I am the Student Success Coach Retention Specialist, and I work inside of the Student Success Center. I've been with STIG for about two years now. In my specific role, uh, the bulk of what I do is help students combat um, barriers to academic success. I deal with a lot of students who are at risk of failing. And um, my primary role for the most part is to kind of support and aid them to um, getting back to um, good academic standing. My past experience include business instruction. My undergrad, I um, majored as a business major, started to teach a little bit business courses outside of that um, and program coordination. Um, and for the most part, my purpose for today as we've already stated is to give you insight on effective studying tips. All right. So this first slide here, and just so you know, a lot of what I'm deciding to share with you is a lot of the type of talk that I have with students that I counsel and advise that have already for the most part started or attempted and had not done so well. Um, but nonetheless, I still do advise students who are doing significantly well, but nonetheless, these are tips that any student can kind of glean from. And what I normally say for students for the most part is, if you're thinking about effective studying or studying effectively, you, you got to start with the mindset, right? So it's a matter of really getting your mind right and really geared up to study, to learn, to get more material. Um, so what I have here is kind of like, you want to just kind of start to kind of take a breath, take a step back and think these key things, you know, think student, you're a student. So that's where your mind should kind of like drift into. You should kind of adapt and get under that particular umbrella of being a student and what it means to be a student. Um, think successful student, right? It's, it's more than, than just signing up for a class and becoming a student. It's okay. Well, I want to obviously be successful because I'm coming to school for a reason and that's to start classes and then to um, hopefully um, pass those classes and obtain a degree. So that is, you know, you trying to be a success, a successful student. Um, I incorporated goals, commitment and discipline as well because oftentimes in order to kind of like get yourself geared up to kind of like be a successful student, you want to kind of create your ultimate goal, what that success looks like for you, get committed to that particular goal and um, discipline yourself to kind of carry it out. And I kind of delve a little more, um, excuse me, I'm just trying to figure out how to get this, I guess maybe up there would work. So I'm gonna delve a little more in um, just the mindset again. It's kind of like thinking as a student. Oftentimes when I meet with a student, you know, they, they, again, as I stated before, I normally meet with students who are at risk or who have possibly already failed the course. So the feedback that I receive or, our, or this particular department that I work in receives is, oh, well, you know, miss, I have a lot going on. I'm not just a student, right? I, I wear multiple hats. I, um, you know, I'm a parent. You know, I have multiple jobs. I'm a part of this organization. I have this activity going on. And, and that, of course, that's, that makes perfect sense. We understand in community college, like, you know, most of our individuals tend to be working as well as be parents, as well as have a whole family. They have a lot going on. So we, we understand that you, have, you wear many hats, but nonetheless, you've decided to come and enroll to stick. 
So we often say, you know, well, why have you added becoming a student? Have you thought about it? Did you think about, okay, I'm now enrolling into school and that I now need to prioritize or rearrange my priorities to make sure that I'm allowing the hat of being a student to have space in all the things that I do. So I'm really driving this point again of just kind of like effective studying. It does not start with you just opening up a book and then quickly trying to read everything and hope that you can kind of like regurgitate all of that when a test time comes. It's purposeful. If you notice here, I say after realizing and adapting the idea of becoming a student, you then take that next step of thinking about how do I want to be a successful student? You know, success doesn't really happen by accident. It really is on purpose. So you have to kind of take a step back when you're considering your classes and decide, um, you know, what approach you want to take. You know, I'm not just a student. Yes, I wear a, a multiple of hats, but actually I want to be successful in this endeavor. So how do I put on that successful student hat? You know, um, successful students, you know, they plan to succeed. So it's important, again, just to kind of get your mind set up to where it's like, I'm not just a student, I didn't just enroll and stick, and I'm going to just kind of hope things go into play. No, I'm going to be purposeful in the things that I do and hopefully allow myself to kind of like reap the reward of being purposeful. You know, sometimes you might say I have a goal of an A, right, and you don't get that A. So that's where that hope you reap the rewards come in. But nonetheless, we're going to go over more steps to kind of help you along that way of being a successful student. Um, again, drilling in the mind reset, you kind of have to put on that cloak of I am a student, not just a student, a successful student. And what does a successful student do? They're pretty purposeful about their success, purposeful about their steps, purposeful about their grades and their studying and uh, um, acquiring information and being able to retain that information. So oftentimes um, I, I, I challenge students to say, you know, think of a goal for yourself as it relates to you being a successful student, right? I pulled this particular definition for a goal. It says an idea of the future or desired results that a person envisions, plan and commit to achieve. So if we're, again, the um, main point here is effective study, right? And you're studying not to just say, hey, I'm a studious person. You're studying to achieve something, right? So you need to be somewhat purposeful in what you're trying to achieve. You, we can get the umbrella of, okay, yes, I want a degree, but you kind of have to get a little micro with everything. You know, It's for what class? Your English class, your psych class, your math class, whatever that is. And then getting a little more micro with that, creating specific goals for those specific classes, right? Um, and so studying with the purpose means being specific about your intended outcome, right? So you're, it's, it's just like it's being comfortable with it's the establishment of goals should be a part of your mindset when you're considering studying effectively. Then we have commitment again. So this particular definition says the state of being dedicated to an activity. So more often than not, when you're creating a goal for studying, you're kind of creating activity. What are you going to do to kind of do better in being able to acquire that information, retain that information so you can apply it to whatever test it is that you might have? And so I put choosing here because there's many definitions you can pull from commitment, but in a lot of ways, choosing, I mean, commitment is a choice, right? So you have this particular goal and now you're choosing to remain steadfast in what you established and whatever that particular goal is, right? And then you, in a way, so, and, and so let me move on to discipline, right? And I'm just gonna kind of bring it all home once um, I'm done with defining discipline. It says to train or develop by instruction and exercise, especially in self-control, right? And then this phrase here that I really like, which was trying to drive my point home, is discipline is the bridge between goals and accomplishments. So in a lot of ways, you're, you've decided to kind of make the goal of studying. Um, you're hoping to be committed to that goal, whatever that particular activity is that you have come up with to decide to do on a consistent basis. 
once you're doing that, it then becomes second nature. And that's the fact that you've now trained yourself and developed yourself in a way that now you're no longer pushing yourself to be an effective um, studious person. It's now just a part of you because now that discipline has trained you to be exactly just that. You can no longer just fall away and, 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 and not remain with these practices because you've allowed, you allowed yourself to one, renew your mind, change your thinking about attempting studying, change your thinking about what it means to be a student, and then envisioning yourself to be a successful student, and then adapting the understanding that in order to be a successful student, you do have to incorporate goals, being committed to those goals, and allowing that commitment to eventually train you and develop you. Um, so if you wanted to kind of like just you know, put an example out there to make sure no one's lost in the sauce of everything that I've been saying is, so for instance, you have like a psychology course, right? And you have that psychology course Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So you have a course, right? And if you want to be a effective, um, studious student um, and, and someone who hopefully will be successful in this particular psychology course, you decide to say, well, let me make a goal. And my goal here would be to um, review my class notes, right? Say you review your class notes every time you have class. So you have classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right after class, you're going to review your class notes. That's the establishment, that was your studying goal that you created for yourself. You then have a choice to remain steadfast in that, right? In a lot of ways, you can come up with strategies to do this, just that. It could be creating a schedule, a reminder, a little alarm in your phone, whatever that is, at the end of the day, you now have your goal and you're now saying, I'm going to be committed to it by utilizing this particular activity. Once you start to adapt and do that, you'll start to realize you have this discipline that has been derived because you're, you've trained yourself to continue that practice. And what happens when you have that discipline, you're not easily shaken out of study. No one can come to you and say, hey, let's go over here. Let's do that later. You are, your, your mindset is, well, no, we can do it after I review my class notes. It's, it's Wednesday. I can't do that. We can do it Thursday, you know? So <clears throat> again, just kind of possibly overdoing it on changing your mindset. But I do think it's just important because I meet with a lot of students and intent does not equal success. Intent does not give you the results. So you might intend to, you know, say, okay, I'm gonna be a student, I'm gonna be a successful student, but it's really about being purposeful and taking the steps needed in order for you to actually um, be successful. So it is a matter of renewing your mind, changing your mind and kind of adapting. I'm a student, I'm a successful student. My goal is to be successful. I'm gonna commit myself to that until it's me without me thinking about it. It's just, it's just a part of my routine, all right? And so we're moving on and oh, this, I don't know why this is now gonna be like troubling me throughout the whole presentation, my apologies, um, but we'll get through it. So nonetheless, um, you cannot, and in my opinion, um, it would be really hard for you to consider effective studying without considering your learning style you know, how you as a student process information. So I do think that it's, oh, excuse me. So I do think that it is highly important for when we talk about effective studying skill sets for you to at the very least learn how you're processing information, right? So I'm gonna click here and I hope this doesn't make me go out of whack, but I wanted to, and I'm going to share every little link that I have here. I'm going to put it in the chat for you guys at the end of the presentation, just so you know. But I wanted to share, okay, here we go. This particular link that I often share with students that I meet with, and it does allow you to take like a quick 20 question um, assessment on what type of learner you are. So I, um, I uh, just wanted to show this to you guys and then also just show you that this particular um, website is pretty neat. It also has which studying habits you can approve. So that's another assessment where you can, for the most part, just see, you know, how am I studying? Is it, is it effective? And it'll kind of give you, you know, 
your results and, and, and tips on what you should do with being able to move forward. So I wanted to quickly um, just run to that. But, um, and again, like I said, it's going to be in the chat for you to utilize, I think it's important. You, if you want to know what type of learner you are, certainly do that assessment. And then that way it'll help you streamline you know, the approach, the best way for you to kind of tackle your assignments, tackle the way you want to take notes, tackle the way you want to um, process the information that you're receiving. It'll help you know, you know, how to do that for the best, how to do that. Oh, this thing is going to bother me. Excuse me. How to do it. Um, how to study in the best way for you based off of the way you process information. All right, so when we are considering the um, three different learning styles, there are actually more now, but I'm, I'm, I'm really just dealing with the basic ones that um, I think has been known a, a bit longer, but I do believe they have, you know, they have kind of fine tuned it to even more specific styles. But nonetheless, you have individuals that is an auditory learner, and that's someone who listens to information. The way they process information, it works best for them by listening. Now, if we're considering study, studying methods as it relates to someone who might be an auditory learner, you want to um, study in a quiet place, right? That tends to affect an individual who um, processes information through auditory learning, right? Use mnemonics, rhymes, and songs. That might aid in an auditory learner's um, ability to retain and, and, and get information. Read out loud, right? Or listen to recordings. Um, for individuals that might be a visual learner, um, they learn better by, you know, a picture or a text, right? So their effective methods may be like pictures, tables, and graphs, a lot of coloring that kind of stimulates, you know, their, their sensation to visualize and see things, and it helps them process information. So um, I would say if you feel like you're a visual learner, you might want to get highlighters and just kind of like color code certain things that might assist you. Um, and lastly, we have kinesthetic learners. And those are individuals that learn by getting a feel for something, right? You, they tend to be fidgety individuals. Like if you're sitting down while you're reading, your knees kind of bouncing, you're kind of jumping a bit, you're, you're fiddling. You, you tend to be someone that it might be a kinesthetic type of learner. You process information that way. Um, and the way individuals can study is like to trace key information, um, use sticky notes and flashcards are helpful. Like, so as you have the sticky notes in your hand, the fact that you're touching it and, you know, moving it around, <clears throat> even flashcards, the fact that you're engaging with those particular things as you're possibly, you know, repeating whatever that terminology, whatever it is, it aids in your ability to process that information. So again, and, and, and this is why um, I say, you know, when we're talking about effective studying, it is very, very important to know how you're processing the information so that you're not doing yourself a disservice and then you can learn styles that um, works or align more with the way you process information. Um, and so I just have this statement here, understanding how you process information is a huge part of studying smart. Know who you are, right? Don't be dishonest with yourself. Um, don't try to pull, push through the way someone, the partner on your left or the person on your right, you're an individual. It's important for you to know how you process information. You know, it's moving on. Okay, so study and strategy. So, we have gone through, you know, um, mindset, right? Being geared, changing your mindset, renewing your mind for being a successful um, student, right? Then we've discussed just kind of learning, you know, how important it is to learn how you process information. We're now moving on to just specific studying strategies, things that have been tested and have been known to be pretty effective in terms of um, just allowing students to kind of like get better at retaining that information. Um, so right, we're gonna delve into these concrete studying strategies. I, for the most part, just like this particular picture because I feel like it's self-explanatory. It's just like this person, you, you know, you, the stage is set, right? It's like, 
if I need to switch up my environment, then, you know, I need to switch up my environment. Um, did I get a good night's rest, right? Listening to calming music, eliminating distractions. I just like this particular um, picture because I just felt like it kind of like really kind of like hit the nail on the head as far as, you know, setting yourself up for success, setting yourself up to get ready to kind of delve in and study. And so we're going to delve in and get some more tips here. So one of the key or biggest tips when it comes to effective studying is note-taking, right? And so the question is, well, why is, why is note-taking so important? And honestly, because most of the tests that's being covered, right, most of the materials that's covered is being presented um, in the class already, right? So your professor is lecturing about it. Um, and so as your professor is, your professor is lecturing about it, how are you going to gain all that information the professor is doing? You're going to do that through note-taking, right? So note-taking helps with your ability to pay attention, stay focused to what is being presented to you, and it also aides in retention. Again, if the, lecture, if the lecturer or your professor is speaking about a particular term, um, they say a lot during the class time. So it, the, the best way to be able to capture what is being said and to capture that information is to jot down notes. Um, studies have shown that 50% of what you hear is forgotten in 20 minutes. So again, just another argument as to why <clears throat> note-taking is considered an effective means of studying. Why you're again listening to that lecture and you're hearing it, oftentimes it have students say, oh, I don't need notes. And you know, you have those um, individuals that tends to be they can hear something once and they never kind of forget it, or they can read something and it stays with them. And that's cool for those individuals. But for the bulk of us, you know, we do kind of have to jot down what's being said. Again, we already stated that most community college students, um, we're not just students, right? We're mothers, we're fathers, we're brothers, we're owners of businesses, we're employees. We have a lot of hats that we're wearing. So, you know, you're not going to remember everything. It's very important to kind of get comfortable with note taking. And in a lot of um, instances, I know you guys are probably like, okay, why are you repeating yourself? Again, I'm used to dealing with students who are not doing particularly well in classes. And they come and they tell me all these things, well, I don't take notes and oh, I don't really feel like I need to. You know, So I'm just kind of really trying to get individuals to jump on board to understand that these strategies are effective and they do work. And the students that I have seen, that get themselves off of academic suspension, get themselves back to good academic standing, they are adapting these particular tips, all right? Moving on, still talking about note-taking. So there are specific systems, right? So one thing to consider when you're considering note-taking um, is notebooks. How are you deciding to organize that information? So I normally say, you know, commit to one notebook per subject, or if you have one of those spiral notebooks, create, have dividers, right? You should just, it, you know, that's, that should be basic kind of one-on-one in terms of deciding to become a student. Commit a notebook, but off, more often than not, a lot of individuals have a one subject notebook and they have all of their materials in that one notebook and they're kind of fumbling and trying to find where the notes was for history, where, oh, that's my math page, you know, so, you know, organizing yourself goes a long way with note-taking. I also say commit to either or a spiral notebook or a three-ring notebook, spiral notebook, you know, once you pull out, you kind of can't add back in. But for some individuals, if that's what works for you, that's what works for you, just commit it for that to be the only subject for that notebook. Three-ring, however, you do have the ease of kind of like taking the page out, putting it back in. If you miss class and someone copies their notes for you, you can then photocopy it and then slide it right into, you know, your three ring notebook. So, you know, <clears throat> again, organization kind of helps when it comes to note taking. Then we move on to formats of notes. <clears throat> so the format of the notes is how you're really writing out your notes, right, as you're in class. So here are a few things. You, you start a new page, right? Some individuals, you can start a new page for each class each day, right? Name, date, topic. So immediately when you're 
going through your papers to go back to study or to review your notes. You know exactly what was being spoken of. It, there's no kind of like, you know how long ago it was, you know what date it was, right? So it's very important when it comes to your notes to be specific again and purposeful. Um, only use one side of a paper, right? Again, it's, it's being organized. For so, so some individuals purposefully say, let me use one side of the paper because if I take notes in class, when I'm going back to review those notes, I might have certain thoughts, certain things that come up. And if I give myself that one side of paper, I can add it there. And if I give, and then, and then I have here skip lines per subject. If you're skipping lines per subject, you're leaving space to be able to add thoughts that might come to you, right? Because your notes should not be something that's written just for you to just have in your notebook and never review again. No, those notes are there for you to go back to review. And if you need to add a little more context, you can certainly do so. So the formatting of the notes, it does matter. Um, you have the other option here where it says, leave, leave wide left side open for topics, people, places, events. Again, that's just kind of like, the way um, you're formatting the paperwork. And I'm gonna show you some examples here. Um, and then we have known effective note-taking techniques. And you probably have heard of these already. They're called the Cornell method, the outlining method, mapping, box and bullet methods. And uh, we're gonna get into just looking at some of them. So here for the, um, you'll see it has the Cornell methods um, and, <clears throat> If you notice, it kind of was mimicking that other um, bullet that was saying, you know, you can put keywords to the left here. So that's pretty that same standard as the Cornell method. You do the keywords to the left. And you and these lines, by the way, you make these lines of, of distinction in your notebook, right? So this is not just for this to be fancy. This is exactly how you would set it up, right? So, and you would basically have a heading as to, you know, what class the date, right? What session this was, what the topic was, the key ideas to the left. And then you have your notes based off of what the lecturer is saying, the key points that the lecturer might be saying to the right. And then the bottom, this is what I, I particularly like the Cornell method, just because I'm a firm believer of summing up what you've gone through in your own words, right? So I think it'd be healthy for you to take even in that example that we spoke about the psychology course, how the student might review their class notes right after class. It's real healthy to kind of like look at everything that the professor was saying and then in your own words, try to kind of regurgitate. Like, let me just rewrite what I feel like the points were, the key things to kind of look at. And, and the reason why to do it then is because you're in that mindset then, right? You know what was being discussed. You know everything that was being spoken of. So when it comes time to review it later, you know exactly what you're talking about here. You're not lost and just looking at all these terms. And so now let's move on to the mapping method. The mapping method is pretty standard too. Um, it speaks um, specifically on the top. You have the topic, right? And then you have like these subtopics. And then you have like these key main points and ideas. And what it's doing is kind of mapping how the three types of plays here in this particular example, um, what does it mean? So it says it's a comedy, right? It's a history, tragedy. And then it's kind of like, again, go delving down more and kind of like naming specific things that should be named here. So, and I mean, I think for the most part, these particular notations are self-explanatory. You can kind of see exactly where they're going with it. Let's move on. So what we have here is the outliner method, which is typically like the method I think you learn like in grade school, like they, you, you're always told the outline method. And it's pretty much the same thing. And that's what notes are for the most part. It is making sure you're adhering to the topic. Then you have the subtopics and then you identifying the main points as you see is taking place. And then even if you go on over here, it doesn't say it on top, it's, a, it's, it's the box and bullet method. So, and again, the same here, it's called box and bullet on purpose because the expectation is you are creating boxes. Your box should be the central point, the idea, that topic of what you're talking about. And then those bullets will then denote um, main points from that main topic, all right? So, I mean, these are methods that have been tried and true. 
um, across not just community colleges, universities, they use this and they send this to their students as um, resources and ways to kind of take effective note taking. So I would encourage you to adopt these methods. Just so you know, I also will be sharing a link that outlines more in depth with this. So that way you can kind of have it and use it as you see fit. Moving on, we're still under studying strategies, specific things on um, being an effective student, right? Studying effectively. So one, this particular topic is this, excuse me, this particular topic is text reading. I have students all the time coming to my office and they're, they're like, you know, Ms. Jackson, I'm reading the material and I just continue to read the material and it's an hour later and then I close the book and I can't remember anything. I don't even know what the heck I just read, but I wasted an hour of my life, you know? And that's not just, if that's you, trust me, it's not just you. It's, 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 it's many students, right? Even the successful students. The only thing that tends to really differentiate is successful students tend to be um, have systems and routines on how to retain that information. Um, and, and so I say, you, you, if you think about college, right, more often than not, you're taking like three classes or more, right? And those three classes, each class has like three books that you have to read, right? So it's like, where in God's green earth am I going to find the time to read all of this material? And so I had learned a practice a long time ago in my undergrad, and it was actually a med student who came to me and was like, you know, you don't really read all of that text. You don't read everything word for word. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, no, like, that's insane. There's no way you can do that. You can't read everything. Someone needs to teach you, you know, how to pull out text features, key points, things to kind of align with what the lecturer is saying and what um, the professor is highlighting. And so you read it to support what the lecturer is saying, and then you read other things that might be in the text that's supporting and providing additional information, but you're, you're not really, unless it's literature, you're not always expected to read everything from cover to um, cover, you know? So he, this particular person said that to me, he showed me a strategy. However, he never had a name for it. He showed me a strategy. And so this was the closest that I was able to find. And I remember this was over 10 years ago, but that I, and I would tell students exactly that, but this I was able to find and I was so happy because even in my undergrad, I had not heard of this, but I feel like it was close to what the um, young man was telling me. And so it's the SQ4R system, right? It's survey, questions, and then the four R's is the R's here, read, recite, record, review, right? So when you're getting a text, the first thing you should be doing is a quick review of the chapter before you start reading, right? So it's highlighting those text features, those things that are bolded, the headings, the subheadings, and taking note of them. Act, and then also reading the summary at the end of each chapter. Now, mind you, this is before you even start to read that particular chapter. It's very important because what it starts to do is stimulate your mind and truly understanding the bulk uh, and the, the, the fruits of that particular chapter. And we know a lot of the text that has a, it, you tend to know the topic, right? And then it has a whole bunch of things in between that you're like, you know what, I, I didn't have to read all of this, right? So again, it's before you even attempt to read that chapter, highlight the title, intro, the intro paragraphs, the text features, and then review that summary at the end of the chapter before you even attempt to read it. And so this other key thing that kind of aligns with the survey is the question. So as you're doing that in terms of surveying those particular chapters, you also want to formulate questions. So you're kind of saying, okay, well, this title was talking about dolphins. Okay, so now your brain is percolating. We're talking about dolphins. Like, what exactly about dolphins, right? So it, it might have other headings that says, you know, why, you know, their their fins curl a particular way. And, I'm, and this is just me just coming up with an example. I don't know. But you now know it's talking about the curling of the dolphin's fin, right? And then you create questions. 
you formulate questions and what it's doing is allowing your brain to engage with the text before you even start reading. So you're kind of like getting yourself a little familiar, especially when it comes to things that just is not your interest and it's hard for you to retain. This particular strategy would definitely help and work you, you know, work for you to read through the, that material that you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I reading? All right? Formulate questions. What you, um, here it says who, what, when, where, why, how, and of course, you know, it depends on what text you're reading. So, and then you actually now read the material, right? And do purposeful reading. And what I say to students oftentimes is when you're reading and you start finding that it's blah, 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 and time is going, you need to stop. Don't waste your time and start giving yourself blocks of moments. If you have lost your focus within a half an hour of reading, you need to then stop and take a break and come back because all you're doing is draining yourself even more, right? You want to try to keep your concentration and your focus. So if you got a good 30 minutes, you focus for 30 minutes, stop, pause, and come back to the text. Take that break and then come back, right? Um, it says here, um, aid in concentration, rotation. Oh, read 50-10 rule, right? So, you know, this can be a, a, rule, a, a, a way that you can kind of tackle reading things that you just know, like I'm not going to retain this information. It's the 50-10 rule. So you read for about 50 minutes and you take a 10-minute break, you know? <clears throat> and I say 30 minutes, honestly, because when I'm dealing with some students, they're like immediately, it's just hard for them to sit. You know, so if 30 minutes is your thing, then do it 30, 30, 10 minute rule, you know, whatever really works for you. But this is just a standard practice, right? You read for about 50 minutes, take a 10 minute break, and then maybe go right back to it if you need to. The next um, thing is recite. And recite is basically just speaking it or recite it out loud. So you can kind of like answer your questions that you formulated, but then you want to do it out loud. Um, and again, all this, these practices is how do I gain and retain the information that I'm reading? That's what these practices are, right? So um, place answers and reasonings in your own words. Yeah, I stated that before. It's so important. A lot of times if you are reading um, material and the definition escapes you, but you can get like the fruit of what the material is saying because you might not know, okay, three of those words, but you kind of can go where the, the book is, the, that particular chapter is placing you, you don't have to focus on so heavily on the words or so heavily on saying things exactly the way the professor said it or the way you read it. It's more important that you're understanding it and then you can then almost repeat it back to yourself, but in your own words. If you can say it in your own words more often than not, you kind of, you, you understand the material. Um, studies show you are likely to remember 80% of what you read after a week and 70% after two months. And so I put this here because it's the, um, well, it was placed under here because yes, you might have um, read something and you remember only 80% of it, but if you combine the reading with then reciting, it's you combining actually hearing it on top of reading it as well to kind of increase your chances to kind of retain that information. All right. Now we're continuing with just text reading. So with the continuing with the four R's, the last two is record and review. And record is just a fancy way of basically saying like note taking, right? So you're, you're, you're taking notes and those notes should be the same areas where you were kind of like when you did the survey, you know, those, those um, bolded letters, the italicized wording, right? Those are key things to kind of like note the subheadings and the headings. Um, sometimes even inside of a book, the, the columns on the left when they have like kind of like I don't know, comprehension material or food for thought. Sometimes those are also helpful to kind of keep the, the points of the text going and also help you to kind of like retain and remember the information. And then the last one is just review, right? More often than not, students are just reading things and then kind of closing the book and then moving on. 
They're never giving themselves the time to kind of review everything that they read. And it's no different than if you already taken those effective notes from reading the book with those headings and subheadings for you to take the time to sit down and review them. You know, recall um, supporting details under each main point. Those are things you want to jot down. And you can, you know, in your review, predict test questions. So if you already in the reading kind of know that this seems to be like a, a huge point, you might want to kind of put an asterisk, whatever it is that'll help you remember, you know, remember this because this seems like it will be something that will be, you know, on a test. All right. And so we're moving on to effective studying strategies and we're no longer doing text reading, but we're going to talk about test taking. So um, I want you to make, I want students to make sure that they know that test anxiety for the most part is an individual who has the material, they know the material. And for whatever reason, when test time comes, it's just like they freeze. They cannot get that material to come out and translate to the paper. And I say that because a lot of times students come in and they might throw out, oh, I have test anxiety. And then I say, well, did you study for the material? No. Well, then you really can't call it test anxiety for that particular test. It's really, you just did not prepare, right? So I would just say, um, make sure you understand what's taking place. You know, you might not be doing well on a test because you're just really not preparing well versus it actually being test anxiety. But so I will ask you these questions though. Do you get nervous when you take a test, right? <clears throat> I, I get nervous even when I know the material. You know, yeah, sometimes you do get nervous because you got to like perform, right? Do you have a hard time answering essay questions? Do you sometimes run out of time? I get that all the time. Students are, I met, miss, I ran out of time. I don't know what I was thinking. I ran out of time. I don't know what's going on. Um, are your test grades lower than you want them to be? And if you say yes, let's just delve into trying to figure out some test taking tips. So when it comes to taking tests and doing it successfully, the best thing possible that you can do is just prepare, prepare. And, and, and all of what we've been talking about for the most part is a part of preparation, right? So, um, but when you do know a test is definitely coming, especially that week, you wanna make sure you prepare the best way possible. Um, I cannot stress enough, please, 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 I, I would even beg, please attend review session, right? If you have a professor who is gracious enough to even have a review session, attend it. A lot of times I get students who said, oh, there was a review session, but I missed it. You should use that review session just as important as taking the test, right? You're getting key information about the exam. And then you might even have the, the opportunity at that time to have a conversation with that professor and ask, specific key questions. Please, 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 I cannot stress enough, attend your review sessions. And study your class notes carefully. Study those class notes carefully. And, and how do you do that if you're not taking good notes? Well, then go back to how do I take notes, right? Utilize those practices, those tips, so that you can take effective notes and then you know that you're studying the proper things when it comes to test time. And you're being real intentional and careful about your notes. And why is that important? Because as we stated before, test questions are more often derived from the class notes, class information that was given. So it's really important. Again, we're thinking about how do I test better on an exam? These are the tips for that. Get a good night's sleep and eat well. And a lot of times I know these are things that you're like, yeah, I heard of, this is pretty simple, but the simple things matter. You know, a lot of times students are up all night, have not slept because they're too busy studying. What does that mean? You were already at a default because you were not prepared. If you had to stay up all night to study that material, it's because you weren't prepared for, to begin with, right? It's very important. Study, 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 but only up until now it's time to rest yourself your brain needs to be able to process that information for you when the test time comes. So it's important to rest and eat well. Make sure you have all your materials in the class. That, that de decreases your anxiety. Because if you now show up to the class and you don't have any of the materials you need, 
um, you're stressed. You don't have, how do I get to class and I don't have nothing to write with, right? That happens to students. Sometimes I've had a student come to me in tears saying, oh my gosh, it was an open book test and I never I didn't bring my book. And I'm like, well, did you know in advance that it was an open book? Yes, right? But that was just that rushing and not being prepared. So make sure you're giving yourself the time to be prepared, right? Know the answers to your textbook review questions, reviewing those questions, if, you know, again, when it comes to taking a test, it's more often than not, if you were supposed to read text, it's more than likely the, summa the summation of that particular document that you read or that textbook that you read, read those key review questions on them. Know the importance of all bold and italic um, words. Again, in whatever text you're reading, and if your professor is telling you that these particular literature is going to be, the, the test is going to be derived from that literature, you want to go back and review um, those subheadings, headings, review questions, and bolded words. Um, try teaching yourself the material, right? So a lot of times I say to students, well, how are you studying? They're like, oh, well, you know, I just kept reading over it. I kept reading over it. I kept reading over it. And I'm like, well, at any point, did you kind of like test yourself or have your partner or a friend test you? And they were like, no, I just kept like looking at the material. And I'm like, well, how would you know if you really were retaining any of the information? You're like, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. And I'm like, yeah, so start using that practice. Go to a loved one and say, hey, here are these questions I want you to ask me, and then I'm going to respond to it. And, you know, let's see if I get it right. And the areas that you know that you're weak in, you know to review more of those areas. Um, for exam day, walk around with index cards with key information. And now, this, again, these are all with the mindset that you're being prepare, right? So you have these index cards already. This is not something that you're doing last minute. You've already created these index cards. These are your review notes. You can utilize those and kind of just take it with you throughout the day up until your exam, you know, just to kind of give you that extra insight on what the material is and that extra, um, that extra, you just feel a bit better about taking the test. You feel a little more comfortable, right? And if there's anything that you know that you might be a little rough on that you keep like forgetting or you're not answering right, you can kind of review those a little more up until the end, yeah. All right, test taking tips, tips. Develop a plan of action once you begin your exam. So this is now the idea of you are actually taking the test right now. So here are some tips. Before you start answering, right, anything on that exam, quickly review the whole test. Decide the timing for each portion. So depending on the type of test, if it's an essay with multiple choice or multiple choice with short answers, you can kind of quickly review the exam and then say, okay, well, I'm going to carve out about 10 minutes here for the multiple choice. I know the essay questions might take me a little longer. You know, you can then quickly just decide how am I going to tack a um, attack this exam and in the best way possible because you know what areas you're short in, right? If you know that you're good with short answers and you feel like you're going to get it, you can decide when to answer it. And then if you can, if you know the timing of the test, you then decide to um, figure out at what particular point you want to choose one for, for the other. Um, <clears throat> and then you have skip over difficult questions, right? So Again, you're taking the test, the test is right in front of you. If you now have reviewed that test real quickly or you're actually in taking the test, you know you should um, skip over the difficult ones. Don't spend too much time. If your test is being timed, clearly just skip over it and go back to it. Yes, you wanna answer everything, but what I will say is that if, if it's taking too much of your time, go on, move on, answer everything else. Um, if you're not sure of an answer, just go with your first instinct. A lot of times it tends to be your first instinct before you start dismissing what you initially thought, right? So if you're hundred percent and just know you're not sure, then just go with your first instinct. I would also say use all the time given. Um, if you still have 10 minutes and use that 10 minutes to just review your answer. Even if it's um, answers that you believe are correct, 
because sometimes you might have misread it when you answered it. Sometimes it's a trick question. So just really utilize all your time when you're taking that test. All right. You can't be more prepared. You, you prepare, 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 and get yourself rested. And then, you know, review before you decide to start or attempt the test. And then when you start seeing that there's a difficulty, skip over it and go back to it. And then and and utilize all your time. Um so now specific testing, right? Like, so what if you're doing all multiple choice questions, right? So here are some tips for multiple choice. Try to come up with the answer in your head before you look at the answer choices, right? So if you read the question and you just simply say to yourself, okay, well, this is the answer. That will solidify you with reading the choices A, B, C, and D. And why? Because those A, B, C, and D already are designed to kind of confuse you. But if you've already answered it and you know the answer in your head, less confusion for you on your part. Um, so that's like a good tactic when it comes to multiple choice. <clears throat> Make sure you read all the choices, right? So sometimes you're reading the multiple choice and you think it sounds like the answer and you quickly just, you know, bubble in A. And then it was actually D that was very similar to A and it might be the correct answer. Just make sure you're reading all of the answer choices before you kind of get happy with bubbling or circling it. Um, if you're unsure about an answer, you know, do a process of elimination, cross out the choices um, that you know are definitely wrong. And let's say you have like two left out of the choices, just make the best educated guess. Right. Don't just be flippant about it. Really take your time and say, okay, it makes more sense to choose this. I'm, you know, I'm kind of not sure. Right. Um, true or false questions. Believe it or not, I heard this that keywords like all, always, never, every, and none are usually false. So if you're if the term is um derived in that way, a lot of times it tends to be a false statement. I put this here hesitantly because I it's it's it's, it's not it's it, of course it's not definite right so I don't want everyone to say well let me look for all always never right so it is you can look for those but then I would caution you to kind of look for those but then also make sure you're understanding what's being said to make sure that if you're going to put false it makes sense for it to be false um read carefully one word will often determine if your statement is true or false Right, so everything might seem like it makes sense, but then it's like that one word that really is kind of like, okay, yeah, this is a false statement. So just reread if you have to when it comes to true or false, because they're designed to be tricky. Um, and then even essay questions. So with an essay question, you wanna just read each question and answer the easier one, right, first, because essay questions take time. So I would say tackle the easier one to get that kind of like out of the way and then you can focus more time on what might be the harder one. Um, a quick thing to do, even write on the test, yes, is to quickly brainstorm and jot down ideas. So, I mean, I know you're like, well, I'm taking the test. Yeah, but you can quickly just, especially sometimes when you read what the expectation is in the essay, your mind starts to kind of percolate and you're coming up with different little terms and stuff you kind of lose those when you're writing the essay if you don't quickly kind of write it down, jot down the idea so you don't lose it while you're deciding to kind of like put it all together. So just make yourself a small little outline of the points you want to kind of like highlight in the text, right? Divide your responses into an opening. So your essay question should, of course, have an opening. It's almost like a mini paper, right? Like a mini um, the, the rules of like somewhat of an introduction, but it's just a little essay. So you want to make sure you have an opening and the reader knows immediately what to expect from the essay. And then that next part, which should be the middle part of your essay, it should provide the examples, facts, and details that's going to support what your main stance was in the first part of the essay. And then lastly, you just make sure that you restate all your points and then provide a concise Conclusion and summary. You want to make sure. So, essay questions is not only about just answering what the question might be, it is the formatting of what's being written and how well you were able to present the facts and 
and how you were able to kind of like conclude. So you want to be mindful of that when it comes to taking um, tests and you have an, an essay question. All right. And so we're moving on here. If my mouse cooperates with me. Can't find. There we go. That was bizarre. All right. <clears throat> so for those who actually have test anxiety, right? Because we're out there. Um, and I, so I don't know if I would say I have test anxiety, but I will say certain subjects I feel like I have test anxiety for. So, um, you know, if it's not about you not preparing, right? And it's more, no, I did prepare. Um, and just honestly, I know the information because as soon as I leave the test room, all of a sudden, all the answers is like there, you know? And then that means, you, you know, you really might, you know, suffer from some, some type of um, anxiety with test taking. So tips to just reduce that. Um, and, I, and I also have a, um, a link that I'm going to share in the chat for this as well. So tips to reduce test anxiety is, you know, replace worrying and negative thoughts with positive ones. And I know these are things that seem so simply said and it's like, well, duh. Of course, you know, if I can think positive, I wouldn't be having test anxiety. But it's about being purposeful, right? So you already feel the anxiety um, happening, whether that's sweating, whether it's nervousness in your body, you kind of feel it coming on. So you now need to mentally, purposefully take a stance and say, you know, excuse me, and say and have dialogue with yourself. I am going to do well in this exam. I know this material. I am not worried. You know what I mean? To combat the symptoms of, you know, anxiousness. Um, mentally see yourself passing the exam, right? If you have to like take a moment and sit down and be like, you know, yes, you know, sometimes I have to kind of call my name, right? When I'm in like these moments of where I'm kind of feeling pretty anxious, I myself have to talk to myself, sit myself to the side and have like a um, bigging myself up moment. Like, girl, you know this material, right? You, 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 you wasn't studying and you didn't prepare for all those hours just to now come and crash. You know, whatever works for you. Everybody does things differently. Um, you know, my husband says he likes to look in the mirror. You know, that's his thing. Whatever works for you. Sometimes you do have to take a moment and speak life into yourself. Speak positivity into yourself. Because you're mentally, when it comes to anxiety, expecting the worst or or fearing, you know, anxiety, the root of anxiety is fear. So it's like this fear of not being able to perform in the best way possible. So sometimes you have to kind of combat that fear, you know, even when you don't feel like it, it's you almost mentally rising up against your emotions and your feelings and taking control. And the way to do that, you know, is again, mentally seeing yourself in that state. I am passing the exam. Um, trying to relax, right? Um, these are not things that are easily taught, right? You don't, you don't get this normally as like things to do. Um, so it, it, this again is purposeful things. Take deep breath, slowly exhale, right? And, and I heard someone say, breathe out that negativity, right? So you pull in a clean, fresh of breath and then blow out all that negativity. Um, relax your body from head to toe. You know, it's, it's, this, again, are mental practices, again, which is why it's important to kind of get your mind right when, it, 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 when you're considering being um, effective in your studying. So you want to kind of like mentally speak to your body, tell your head to rest itself, your hand to rest itself, just every part of your body so that it can relax and that anxious feeling kind of alleviates, you know? Visualize being in the place that is the most calming for you. You know, for some individuals that work, that doesn't necessarily work for me. I've always tried to do, you know, visualize and I'm just still like, um, I, I know I'm in my office, right? But don't knock it until you try it because I've had individuals criticize such things like this and then they actually do it. And they're like, oh my gosh, that actually worked for me. 
So I would just say, just try different techniques. When you read it at first, it might not seem like it meshes well with you because you've never done it and you know that's not my vibe. And you know, noted, but unless you try it, you know, you might not really know. Um, and anxiety really is, you know, a mental state. It is you being on this high alert level of stress. So you do have to calm yourself down. So whatever way would be calming for you, I would say practice that when you get to the point when you start realizing you're stressing over this test or the test is now happening and you are like straight up stressed and you got to kind of get back to this place of calm, you know, whether it's you coaching yourself, get back to calm, get back to calm. You know that you know this answer, you know this answer, you know? Um, and this quote here that I just liked, having test anxiety is like not having the password to your computer the information is there, you just can't get to it, right? <clears throat> so you know the material, right? You know the stuff. It's just, you just can't get to it because you get into this freeze mode. The anxiety kind of clams you up. And so there are a lot more um, practices and tips with um, test anxiety. And so, like I said, I'm going to put it in the chat for you guys to grab at the end of this presentation. All right, so we're kind of like, getting to you know really wrapping it up those were the studying um strategies those specific tips that we discussed um test taking tips tips text reading tips and just those effective note taking um right now what i want to move on to is just online studying tips this day and age right you know that the bulk of our classes right now is done um remotely so these, these are just some key things that with, with um, meeting with students, what I just kind of like go over with them and make sure that they're clear on. Um, because we know, um, you know, some of the platforms, some of the online material, it can be pretty challenging for students, right? So I would say when it comes to online studying and you're taking online classes, you want to make sure that you're purposeful in everything that you're doing. Treat those online classes like an in-person class. Even when it comes to you getting up and getting ready to study, get up, take a shower, brush your teeth, right? Literally engage in the mindset and the concept of studying, even though, yes, you're technically in your bedroom, in your living room, on your kitchen table. And the reason why I say that, because again, a lot of um, effective practices or ability to um, study effectively and retain the information is a huge mindset component. So when you kind of are like in your role, you're so relaxed that it's really putting you back to sleep mode. So you're kind of psyching your, your subconscious out by getting yourself up and getting dressed like you're going somewhere, but you're really just going to the kitchen table. Um, you're trying to say to yourself, I'm a student. I'm like, I'm putting myself in that mode right now. No, I am a student, I'm going to the screen. Yes, I'm in my kitchen, but I'm not cooking in this space and in this time, I am a student, right? So um, I would say really purpose yourself in doing that. Even with work, so even with this day and age, like even myself, like I am technically half on campus, half at home. I still get up and I put clothes on, I don't put my work clothes on, but I do get up with the purpose of saying like, you need to be engaged. Even if, even if I don't have a meeting, you know, and I'm just literally like typing on my computer, I have to do it because if it's not myself that gets so, too familiar with like sitting on the couch, I'll doze off. Um, my son is like, oh, well, you know, you're not in the meeting. You can come do X, Y, and Z. And I have to like, no, I'm working. So it's really important to try your best not to blur the lines. If you have said I'm doing online learning and this is my space for online, you've got to like really establish that so that you can be effective, you know? I'm not saying you can't do well. I'm saying you probably would, you probably would do a whole lot better if you created that extra step of getting your mind consistent with understanding I'm in school right now, even though I'm in my kitchen table, you know? Familiarize yourself with the online platform. 
does this help with studying effectively? Of course it does, because a lot of times your professor has put review notes online, review videos. And I, I can't tell you how many times I have, I've gone in the student's Blackboard with them because they're just confused about the platform or they are, are going to endanger of failing a class. And I kind of skim through and I see literally videos that the professor had, had put in weeks ago that would have really, really helped the student. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even notice that was there. You know, so it's really, really, really important. I can't um, stress it enough to familiarize yourself with that online platform. Some professors utilize other platforms. So yeah, we're utilizing Blackboard, but even within Blackboard, they might say, um, I want you to get familiar with this Cengage, you know, platform that we're using, even though it's going to be within Blackboard, I want you to still go onto this particular website. If, the, if that's the case, get familiar with that other website, right? So you know how to navigate and do exactly what's expected of you for that class. I would also say um, carve out time to review. When it comes to, so there's different types of online learning, right? We have the blended synchronous, right? Where you're basically at home remote, but you are able to go in through Zoom. But then you have um, the hybrid where you still kind of come on campus and you get back online. And then you have, which, the, which is the completely remote one, where you're essentially lecturing yourself. You're reading the material. There's no professor there. You can consult your professor possibly through like office hours. But at the time, essentially, you have to read the material yourself. So it will be very vital and very important that you're carving out time that allows you to do just that. Just review the material. Your first time reading the material, reviewing the material, that should be, quote, unquote, your class time, you lecturing the material to yourself. It is very important to carve out time to do that and then carve out time to do the work and then carve out additional time to review the work. Um, I would say also use the resources that your teachers provide. Students always say, well, I don't know how to get in contact with my teacher. And I pull up the syllabus and right there on the syllabus, they, the, the professor has offered their cellular phone and says, text me if you have a question, right? And I'm like, well, the professor says to text her, you know? So it's very important to make sure you're reading and utilizing all of the resources that the professor is providing for you. Um, office hours, right, and supplemental material. Do not just bypass it as a whole bunch of paperwork that they're handing off to you. It's purposeful while you're getting those materials. Read it. Um, create a dedicated study space um, free from distractions. You know, you know your life. You know, you know what's going to easily distract you. You know, if your cell phone is a distraction, be honest about it move it when you're when you're deciding to say I'm going to study from for two hours right here not interrupted you know to not have your cell phone next to you right be honest with yourself if you want to be successful be purposeful and if a part of being purposeful is saying I need to move my cell phone from me because it's going to derail my studying then you do exactly just that I think you will live without your cell phone for two hours of studying um, and, you know, self-explanatory things that where it's like take notes, right? Um, email your professor regularly or check your email, not email your professor, check your email. Please check it. If you're taking online classes, that's the bulk of the way that the professor will be contacting you. Professors sometimes, um, you have those professors that are great about their syllabus. They have everything you need to know, right? Then you have those professors that aren't so great. They, you know, you get material or new things pop up throughout the week. And so that's a part of the territory. You kind of have to kind of like just be present and aware, okay, this professor is just going to email me every week. And then you, so you're making sure that your, their email is not going to spam and you're making sure that you're checking your emails, right? Um, Pop-up quiz, pop-up tests. You, you want to make sure you know what's going on in the class. Um, and don't procrastinate. You know, I, a lot of times the, the biggest myth with online um, classes is it can wait or I can get to it because I don't technically have to go to class. I can certainly 
to, you know, get to the material and eventually do it. That's the biggest lie. I feel like more often than not, I'm getting more students with online learning that, you know, calls me in tears and says, you know, I'm overwhelmed. I thought I could do it because I procrastinated. You know, and we know procrastination is a part of what takes place, you know, in education, but more often than not, a lot of times students, because they feel like it's so close that they mentally tell themselves, oh, I'll get to it. I'm gonna get to it tonight. And then tonight comes and they fall asleep and they don't do it, right? And then they realize, they wake up and they realize I have all this work and I have no time to do it. So I will certainly say and urge you, create a schedule. Do not procrastinate when it comes to online learning. Yes, a part of it is at ease because you don't have to leave your home. But outside of that, I think that's the only real ease about it. Everything else is very purposeful and you kind of have to like rise to the occasion with taking online classes. Don't look at it as it just being like easy because it's that's so far from the truth. All right. <clears throat> and I wanted to share this with you guys. And the reason why is because I normally do this with students who are taking online classes. If you remember what I was stating before, I was real purposeful about if you are taking those remote option classes where you really just get the material and read it yourself, it's really important. So here where I have psych lecture, that's really, this particular student was really just saying like, I just need time to review the material before just what the professor wants me to learn, right? So that means you are lecturing yourself. Get, she took two hours to sit down and lecture herself. That's not doing the homework. That's not studying. That's not reviewing. That is literally her just learning the material to lecture it to herself, gathering the information, right? So if you ask me, I feel like that's a bit harder than going on a class, you know, where you can have the professor lecture to you. So the classes are certainly there for students to utilize and utilize it, you know, because of course, no one wants to, you know, have to deal with, you know, um, everything that this pandemic has brought forth, right? You, you have the option to be at home and take online classes. My point is that if you're choosing to do it, then actually rise to the occasion, do all that, put the effort in that's necessary and required in order for you to be able to do well in those classes. So this particular student had realized, you know, she was one of those individuals that um, procrastinated and realized that the online class is kind of like was catching up for her, all the workload. And then so we sat down and I had to explain to her, you need to carve out time to lecture the material to yourself, then give yourself a break, then go back to the material, right? And the reason why it's so important to take breaks is when it comes to online classes is because that screen time, it really gets to you. It really, really gets to you. So I just wanted to share this because I wanted students, and every time I share this with an online student who does it in that remote capacity, they're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I now know what I need to do, right? So I wanted to share it with you guys because I do think it's important to take out that time for yourself to say, this is my lecture time. I'm now gonna take a break, right? Get away from the screen, really take a real good break come back, tackle some homework, take a break, eat, whatever it is I need to do, go back to it and then review that material. And I will also partly say, because when it comes to lecture, you have the luxury of hearing someone say it to you. So you have the, the, the audio of individuals speaking as well as your notes. When you're taking these online classes, you don't have no one lecturing to you. So it's almost like you kind of, you got to like double do. You got to read it and then almost like lecture it, summarize it to yourself. And then it should give you that ability to then attack the homework and then attack the review and study session or create the best types of notes for yourself to be able to attack the assignment. All right. Let's move on. And so, yeah, we're kind of like coming to a close. What I really want to say just in part is just the idea of studying smart, not hard, right? It becomes hard when you're not preparing. It becomes hard when you're not taking those little blockets of time to kind of review material and then give yourself a break, review material, give yourself a break. 
it becomes hard when you wait until the last minute. It becomes hard when you start to kind of have your grades fell on you. And then you hear my office say, hey, you're on academic suspension, academic warning. You know, that's when it becomes really hard because now you got to get yourself up and out of the rut. And so what I'm hoping with this particular um, webinar is for individuals to kind of just start off now, right? Um, being more proactive versus retroactive. And so um, I would say you decided to become a student, right? So, you know, do all the things that's necessary. Put the effort in the work that's necessary to um, actually get what it is you started. You know, you came here for a purpose. You want a degree. So let's get it. Let's not prolong it by you not doing well in your classes, right? Um, and so these are just additional steps, you know, key things, always put your phone away, continue to learn effective studying practices and utilize them. Because of course, these are not the beginning and ending of effective ways to study. You know, a lot of individuals have different practices that help. So I would say, you know, go on YouTube, go on the website and see what's out there and see if it works for you. I would say get organized, use a planner. You can use also apps. Um, Try not to multitask, right? Like when it comes to really studying whatever that particular subject is, hone in on that subject, right? At that moment, you need to say two hours. It's nothing but me in this math um, book. That's it. I'm not, I'm not thinking about that paper, that research paper. Right now, I'm just math, you know? Don't make the mistakes of multitasking and allowing your brain to try to like divvy up information in different ways. No, just focus for the two hours, give yourself the break. And then if you want to get into another subject, then go on to the other subject. Um, short study burst. Um, it's kind of what I've been saying when it comes to, when it, when, with the idea of you literally studying and then like 30 minutes and then just stop, give yourself a break and then go back and study. And so if you're being prepared and you're taking the time out to do that type of stuff, again, that's studying smart and not hard. You have the space to do a little study burst. If you're waiting for the last minute, then there's no such thing as doing that because you're just trying to cram everything in. So a huge, huge component is just not waiting to the last minute, being prepared, utilizing those note-taking techniques, um, the text reading techniques, right? So you can just always go back and study it because it's already there, right? And then take your break and then go back as you need. Um, consider space repetition systems. And those are, it's, it's pretty similar to like short study bursts in a way, but this is like a tried and true type of, um, and you probably will see it, SRS. Um, it's, it, I mean, um, index cards are SRS. You know, it's, it's a matter of you taking, um, space and time to kind of study something, right? Stop and go back to it in a, re like in a repeated format. So uh, the best example, like I said, is index cards. You going through index cards, right? For a certain time and period, stopping, right? Giving yourself space and going back and repeating that same thing. That is like a tried and true, you know, system. There are others out there. So I would say consider more of those systems because the, that particular system is known to help individuals retain information. You know, um, pay attention in class. I know it's sometimes easy to kind of like just drift off somewhere, especially if it's just a boring class. You know, sometimes you have a monotone professor and you just kind of like drift someplace else. You know, try to be purposeful, kind of figure out systems to kind of get yourself back to focusing, right? Um, review class notes at the end of each class. Again, trying to summation, put, um, put it, summarize it into your own thoughts and your own ways of thinking. That way you can kind of solidify it with you um, as opposed to trying to use the exact definition and exact terms. It becomes very hard to kind of remember things that way. Um, um, Designate a study area, we went over that. Um, manage your environment, you know, stand clear of distractions. And honestly, sometimes when I'm speaking to I mean, like orientations, I just, one of the biggest things I like to say to students that come on board is learn to be comfortable with asking questions. I cannot stress that enough. I don't care if the professor had already stated it, you do have to just get to a point where if you missed whatever that answer is, 
just get, ask the question. You, you, get, you gotta get comfortable with just asking the question because if you don't know, you don't know, right? So the only way you can know is to ask questions. And if individuals don't know that you don't know, then they're gonna just keep on going right by. You know, so you have that moment of, you know, feeling funny because you don't know the answer, right? But then once you get the answer, you have a lifetime of with having the answer. So you're kind of combating that one moment where you feel like, oh, I don't know if I should ask the question versus a lifetime of having the answer. Just ask the question. Um, and I would also say, make a study schedule, make a plan. You want to be effective in your studying practices and, and all these tips and everything. They certainly will work, but you also need to schedule and plan, put it into a system that's going to work for you. You have many hats, as we stated. You know, you're not just a student, you do other things. So then create a study schedule, all right? And then what I have here is just apps to assist you um, this day and age. I'm still kind of like a paper and notepad type of person, um, but, excuse me, um, you know, individuals like apps. So, you know, I, um, some of these apps, are pretty decent, like Study Blue digital flashcards. That's pretty much what it is. Um, my study is like, it helps with like planning and organizing like classwork and homework and reminding you of exams. Um, I Studies Pro, it's this organizing as well. It's pretty similar to my study life. Quizlet, it aids in like um, studying kind of that SRS that we just finished speaking about, like the space system rep petition, it kind of, you know, give you flashcards and things like that. Um, and Simple Mind, it organizes your thoughts. It's actually an intuitive um, app is what I read up on it. And it kind of will generate like helpful ideas as you're trying to kind of come up with ideas yourself. So I would say, and, and these are just really a few, there's so many out there. And I just wanted to share this option with you guys as an additional resource or a way to kind of like study effectively. And lastly, this last slide for the most part is just the campus resources. I, I, I always, you know, make sure I include this in any presentation I do, especially even here in it being um, uh, effective studying um, presentation. To the point that we do so much as students, we're not just a student, we have a lot of things going on. Makes it for me more important to kind of highlight the campus resources, because if you have other things going on, it might be, you know, vying for your attention, not that it might be, I'm sure it is. So if you have things that might be going on and you don't know how to, you know, deal with it, combat it, come out of it. I want you to know that there are services on campus that are here just to support and aid and help students, whether it's counseling services, mentoring. Sometimes you just, you feel overwhelmed because you don't even know what to do next. And because you're overwhelmed, it's showing in your ability to study and retain material because you have personal things going on with your family or at home, you, you, you know, just things mentally that you're dealing with yourself, it now is, it can be seen as a barrier because now it's vying for your attention, which is pulling your ability to focus like you would like to on your study and, and your work. And so I can't urge enough and stress enough for students to really consider utilizing the campus resources that we have. And all the time students come in, I speak to them and then they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I have a learning disability. And I'm like, oh, we have the Office of Disability Services. Oh, I didn't know we had that. You know, I have a student come in and say, you know, I suffer badly ADHD. I take a whole lot of medication for ADHD. And I'm like, okay, well, um, and you know, I suffer from depression. I'm like, well, you know, we have counseling support as well. Oh, I didn't know that. You know, some, student, some students come in and they're like, oh, I, I suck in math. I just can't get it. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, well, have you ever gone and gotten a tutor? Well, I don't have any money for tutoring. And I'm like, well, you know, we offer tutoring and it's free. You know, so, oh, I didn't know. For some reason, I thought I had to pay for it. And so please know that we have resources on campus. And even if sometimes some of these resources are not 
ability to help you directly. A lot of times we know of other community resources that might be available to you. Um, I do wanna highlight CAS, the Center for Access Services. That is a center that is more specific for outside of academic needs. So homelessness, um, food insecurity, some financial situations that students you know, find themselves in and they need assistance. CAS is certainly the office to reach out to and often Time, students don't even know that they exist. And again, if you don't have room and board for yourself, you don't have um, food, you don't have access to certain things, then how on God's green earth can we expect you to perform successfully as a student? You know, so we want you to be able to take care of your basic needs and then, you know, ultimately continue on and complete your your goal of, you know, obtaining a, a degree, a certificate, you know, whatever that is. So certainly, um, I would say, utilize um, the resources. And even if you, you're not sure, just try, see if they might have an answer for you. All right. And so I don't know why my slides just okay, there we go. <laughs> and so I just thank you guys. Um, for your attention and I am going to leave the chat open if you have any questions. I would also say bear with me, I'm going to add those links that I promised I would send to you and thank you.